Hi there, I'm David Harvey, and I'm here with John Andrews, and this is the Two Texts Podcast. In this podcast, we're two friends in two different countries here every two weeks talking about two different texts from the Bible. Before we jump into this episode, I want to tell you about something we're doing over on our YouTube channel. This week, we're going to post an unedited video podcast of us recording today's episode. So, if you want to hear us talk for a little longer and see us laughing from our own offices, then head over to Two Texts on YouTube. Let us know what you think of the format in the comments. But now, on with the podcast. This is episode 11 from our second season on the miracles of Jesus. This episode is called, Suddenly... Oh, man. Well, John, we are back and still in your homeland of the Bible, I'm going to call it <laughs> Luke's Luke's Gospel. I'm hoping that when I suggest to you that we do a Galatians series, you'll remember all this time I've spent in, uh, in, in Luke. <laughs> absolutely, man, absolutely, um, yes, very, very good. But we mentioned a couple of times that there's... Uh, four miracle stories in Luke's gospel that are not in the other gospels. And we talked about two of them in our in our last uh, run of uh, episodes. And now we're going to just look at the other two uh, in this episode and the next episode. So we're mm. in Luke chapter 14, and, yeah. and we're going to read, there's a miracle story and then a little bit of a follow-up conversation from Jesus. So shall we just jump straight in? Yeah, no problem. So It's Luke 14, we're jumping in at verse 1, and it says this, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body, or some translations may have dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked them, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into a well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull it out? And they had nothing to say. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honour at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honour. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honoured in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters or relatives, or your rich neighbours. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Wow, beautiful. We'll leave it there. Some of our uh, loyal listeners will know that we, of course, have leaned into the the parable immediately following the end of our reading there. We've we've already touched on the great banquet, which we will probably have to reflect on a little bit again in the context of this miracle yes. but we're, we're we're leaving the reading there because we've sort of yes. covered that ground before so uh beautiful story. yeah that's episode 13 episode 13 of the parables series you can go and uh See, and listen you, to you just know this stuff i just know we've done that <laughs> the number david that's what makes you just remarkable and amazing you are the detail man thank you number 13 folks if you want to catch up (laughs) absolutely and the great thing about that is if you've not had enough of banquets by the end of episode 13 you can then actually jump over to the next episode which is matthew's story of the great banquet i'm just going to say this right at the start john because i love i love jesus's way but there are moments where people say i wonder why jesus had 
you know, enemies. And and then, mm. then you see, you read a story like this, and Jesus is at a banquet where somebody has invited all of their friends, and Jesus decides <laughs> to say, oh, hey, by the way, when you're having a banquet, don't invite all your friends. <laughs> Because like, yes. they'll just invite you back. And I wonder if the people sat around the table are thinking they're not inviting you back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. Uh, and of course, it, it's really, it is really interesting that this little story introduces a sort of two little trilogies for us in a sense. Mm-hmm. This story is the third and final Sabbath healing in the Gospel mm-hmm. of Luke. That's, And, and I think yes. there's a little bit of a nuance worth leaning into there and of course it's the third time jesus has dinner at the house of a pharisee in the gospel of luke Mm. he's already been there in chapter seven very controversially Mm. with simon and that woman who anoints jesus and then chapter 11 so uh, there's a gorgeous little collision taking place here of two sets of three the sort of third sabbath Mm. miracle which i think does have nuance and also the third mm. Pharisaic meal. And and you're absolutely right in saying, I think wanted to write a book of how to win friends and influence people, then then this <laughs> may not be part of that book. But but in saying that, of course, there is a beautiful subtext to Luke in that I genuinely think that in in the fact that we have three meals of Jesus with Pharisees shows his willingness to meet with the Pharisees. And in fact, mm-hmm. if you look at chapter 11, where Jesus pronounces some of the woes on the Pharisees, it's within the context of a meal, which which mm-hmm. tends to soften it in the sense of it's probably a much more conversational style moment rather yes. than Jesus standing on a soapbox sort of attacking the religious community. Mm-hmm. So there is a sense in which we see him eating a lot with sinners, and we've reflected on this one mm-hmm. in our previous episodes. But the fact that this is the third time we're seeing him in the house of a Pharisee, even though uh, it does get a bit edgy and a bit caustic in the context of the conversation, yeah. shows that Jesus wants to be there, and he actually wants to hang out with these guys because I yes. think he's desperately trying to win them to his way of thinking, as, of course, they are with him. So uh, fascinating little yeah. insights, I think. And and it's interesting that, like, I noticed that as I as I was reading this this passage, the the very f- kind of opening of verse one, I, I find myself Jesus is he's gone to the house of the leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath day, and then there's that that closing clause to the sentence, mm. and they were watching him closely. The 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 Greek word there almost. Like if you if you had to sort of try and clunkily translate that word literally, it's like they were standing by the side and mm-hmm. and looking and, and keeping guard almost over over what's happening. And it, it just made me think about the tension that Jesus' ministry is happening under. It, it, this is this is actually quite a tense situation. I have been in, involved in interview processes before. I, I think you have as well. And I've I've gone to a church and the church has sort of thought, oh, do we want to employ this guy as our pastor? And and everybody does these things where it's like come and preach for us and then it's like and come and have come and have dinner. And you go to someone's house for dinner and half of your interview panel are there and you realize Oh, this dinner has a purpose. Indeed. <laughs> this is not Indeed. You, this is you not we want dinner. to make you sure. The... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is not we just want to make sure you're not hungry. This is when you're relaxed over food, will you say something that will get you in trouble? And yeah. and and that's in a positive and friendly environment I've been in. They've always been lovely experiences. But Jesus is in a situation where he's at a dinner and everybody's waiting for him to make a mistake because they're wanting the mistake. They actually, they want to have things go badly for them. So, so this tension's very, mm. very difficult, really. And, and then it made me think about how much of Jesus' ministry is happening under that exact tension. There's this sure. constant analysis mm. going on. For sure. And it does, if you, if you run the line of the three Sabbath miracles, there is a wee mm. pattern there. So, the first Sabbath miracle in Luke is in Luke chapter 6, the man who has the shriveled mm-hmm. hand. He's already in the, in the synagogue. Jesus goes in and essentially heals him. But but there's a, a lovely connector there. In Luke 6, 6, it says, The Pharisees mm-hmm. and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason 
to accuse Jesus. So they watched mm. him closely to see if he would heal on oh. the Sabbath. Now, what's really interesting is that the, the, if you read Luke 6, the, the implication is the man's already in the synagogue, but you do get the impression that he may have been strategically positioned in the synagogue uh, just to see what Jesus would do. So it's really interesting mm. that. And of course, we reflect... Same word it. as well, John. Indeed. Same word Indeed. there. That that Indeed. that they were stood by watching closely. So Absolutely. It's so it's... Yeah, it's not like they're spying from a distance with spyware in the corner. It's like they're they're really <laughs> up close and personal here, and and maybe when you understand that, you realize some of the 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 I don't want to be too strong here, but the aggression of Jesus in some of those moments, he is a bit distressed mm. by their behavior. Mm. If you follow that sort of trajectory into Luke thirteen, which we've already done, so our listeners can go back and listen to that, the one where behold the woman in Luke 13. It's not that they are watching him closely, but there's clearly a massive public reaction from the leader of the synagogue. So if you put Luke 6 together with Luke 13, I think what you're getting is a pattern. And I think then Luke 14 is, can can I put this carefully, is as close to a setup as you're going to get. And it feels a little bit like that. So if you look at verse 2, there was a man in front of him suffering mm-hmm. from dropsy. Is that a coincidence? Is that is that sort of, uh, he just happens to be there? Or, or is this that actually he's being positioned before him? Now, it, it, it doesn't really mm-hmm. change the story, of course, but if you mm-hmm. add mm-hmm. the trajectory of chapter 14, with 6 and 13, the two other Sabbath mm-hmm. miracles, I think you've potentially got a possible setup here where in the mm-hmm. house of the prominent Pharisee, or at least in his courtyard, where people could listen on or watch on the proceedings, mm-hmm. this man is suddenly positioned in front of Jesus. Yeah. And you're almost getting echoes of both the previous stories. If you if you look at how Jesus yes. responds, the questions he asks, the things he says, it's it's almost like a version of Luke six and Luke thirteen put together. Mm-hmm. And it's worth mm-hmm. our listeners just checking in on that. And and I think that's a reflection of the growing tension between Jesus and the religious community over Shabbat and how Shabbat should be practiced. Does that make sense in yeah. terms of trying to connect those three? Uh, yeah, totally. And, and and even like I'm just leafing back and forward through my Greek New Testament, as you're saying that there, it's interesting between 13 and with the, with the woman that we talked about in the last episode mm-hmm. and 14, today's episode, kai edu anthropos, and behold a man. Indeed. And in Indeed. verse 13, Indeed. kai edu gune, and behold a woman. It's, it's, yeah. it's, the, it's the same it's, introduction. It it, it's sort of, it, it's like yeah. enter stage right, the... The, the catalyst of the story. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So in 13, we talked about the woman appearing by her own voluntary action, and that's mm-hmm. a possibility. Here is the man appearing by his own voluntary action, or has he been sort of nudged to the front by some yes. of the people that Jesus yeah. is eating with? So it, it's worth a little consideration. It doesn't change the story, but it adds an interesting subtext to the three Sabbath miracles, and that's worth yes. considering as a pattern. And I yes. thought that was fascinating. And and so we, we've read the story already, so we can get to some detail of it shortly, but but hold on that thought of, of, of the Sabbath. Um, yeah, in, in his commentary on Luke, I was just leafing through recently, John Noland, his, he's this multi-part commentary on Luke, and he, he has this phrase where he says this, individuals touched by Jesus's ministry have now a new experience of Sabbath as a day of, of the liberation of needs. Come on. That's and lovely. I love that. A new that experience good. of the Sabbath of as a day of the liberation mm. of needs. And so, so I, I'm curious how you react to that. I'm hearing your kind of initial emotional reaction, but this idea that, that Jesus is doing something with the notion of Sabbath. It's more than just, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to put things that aren't there, but I, I, I don't, 
I don't think you want to take this story or any of these three stories that you've just talked us through as Jesus got up one Sabbath day and thought, oh, I know how I can really annoy everyone. Uh, I'll go do some miracles, right? I think if, if we ended up with that, that Jesus did miracles on the Sabbath because he wanted to annoy the religious establishment, I think we've misunderstood Jesus. And I, and I think about that even in my own life. I... I think it comes with Celtic blood, where we like a little controversy, and um, you know, and and we like we like a little fight every now and again. Those of us that are, are kind of raised in well, you and me both they share some Celtic blood in that we sense, do. don't we? we do. And 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 so there can sometimes be a sense of a personality type, which is just I like being controversial, and and I feel like being controversial for controversy's sake isn't a kind of holy quality, but sometimes in the pursuit of, of what God has called someone to, that might bring controversy. And, and that's what I think is going on with, with Jesus here, that he's actually trying to do something with, with our understanding of Sabbath. He's actually trying to 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 drive something. So yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, I have, I have some other thoughts on, on that, but but how do you respond to that sort of thought process? Oh, I love that. I think it's on the money. I I think that Jesus is not trying to get under anyone's skin. I think he is mm. demonstrating, to quote Luke sick again, that he is Lord of the Sabbath, that, that actually mm-hmm. he is redefining, reinterpreting, reshaping, representing the original ideas of Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to the original day of rest, as it were, day seven of creation, this is a mm-hmm. day when God doesn't need to rest because God is God, <laughs> uh, self-sufficient and eternal. Yet he enters rest. And the first humans, mm. man and woman, have just been made. They don't need a rest. They haven't done anything yet. Mm. So so the rest of that first week of creation has nothing to do with physicality. Nothing to do with physicality. It can't be because yes. God doesn't need physical rest. And the man and the woman, mm. unless they've been made badly, they don't need a physical rest on their first day of mm-hmm. full creation mm-hmm. because I haven't done anything. <laughs> yeah. So so something else is in the rest. It, there's it's and interestingly, David, in the Genesis account, it's the only day without boundary. Evening and morning the first day. That goes right up to day six. Mm-hmm. When it comes to day seven, there is no evening and morning. Now again in the Hebraic pattern, wow. that can't be a coincidence. I, I that can't be a fluke. I think something is being uh, powerfully nuanced there to say that Shabbat was never ever meant to be confined to a day of regulation when it was meant Mm -hmm. to be as it were a disposition it was meant to be something that Mm -hmm. we lived and understood as a lifestyle and therefore Mm -hmm. that whatever work now the humans do they work out of rest they're they're not Mm -hmm. they're not resting from work which is our pattern generally but they're working Mm -hmm. out of rest Mm -hmm. That's a profound idea in the Genesis text and one, mm. I think, which Jesus is bringing back to us. He's bringing back the message yeah. of liberation. And of course, if you macro that into Luke 4, where Jesus is clearly announcing Jubilee, he's clearly announcing mm. this idea of a year of complete free Shabbat restoration of, of all things. I mean, then then. There's a macro Shabbat that he's bringing in. It's not just he Mm -hmm. keeps the Sabbath because he's a good Jewish man, but there is a macro Shabbat he's bringing, which is all to do with the liberation of the poor and the setting free of the captive and the opening the eyes of the blind. So you get this magnificent. So if that's part of his programmatic idea that he's bringing Mm -hmm. macro Shabbat, this jubilee Shabbat, then every time he does a miracle on the Sabbath, it's not about getting up somebody's nose. It's not about irritating <laughs> the religious. It is actually about announcing what Shabbat was always intended to be, a, a time of mm. liberation, life, restoration, realignment, redemption. All of those amazing ideas are contained in these miracles. And I think if you lean into that, then then actually there's, there's a much bigger idea being captured here. I want to talk about Sabbath more. I want to, I want to yeah. keep exploring that with you, John. I mean, so you, you wrote a book on Sabbath a few years ago, didn't you? I did. So I I'll... did. I, I wrote a little book called First Day. So mm. the idea that day seven, Shabbat, that, I mean, it's not called Shabbat Genesis, but that, that first mm. Sabbath, as it were, mm. was, was day seven in the week of creation, but the mm. first day of humans' yeah. journey 
and, and and from sort of those nuances that something first is very powerful in biblical thinking. Mm-hmm. So so I just leaned into what what was it about and what does it maybe look like in a 21st century context? And then there's been some great books brought out recently. And and some mm. I mean I mean I have to say I was influenced tremendously in terms of my some of my Jewish thinking by Abraham mm. uh, Heschel's book Sabbath, which is just superb, written from a, a strong Jewish viewpoint, of course, but well mm. worth consideration and understanding yeah. our ideas around Shabbat. So brilliant stuff, yeah. yeah. So that, I mean that sort of people are interested. One of the things that I, I love about what Heschel does is is he talks about how. And and please correct me if I'm, I'm misquoting because I'm, I'm doing this a bit from memory here, John. But Heschel talks about how God in the creation story gives humanity this role of guiding creation. That that humanity's job is to care for this creation, right? But but that God's job in the creation story is 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 time. And mm-hmm. and, and and Heschel talks about how what humanity wants to do is that we want to control time. Because we actually want to try and control everything, and mm-hmm. Sabbath is is this way of reminding us that we're not in control of time. Mm-hmm. That 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 every six days there'll be another day comes and you have to stop. Uh, and I think there's, to me, I find that really interesting as a thought process. That that I want to be in control, and yeah. Sabbath reminds me that I'm not in control of all the things I think I'm in control of, yeah. and. And then you think about the arguments that Jesus is happening, having, mm. sorry, they're, they're arguments about control, aren't they? they you are. can't heal this person here and you can't heal those people over there. I, did, I mean, yeah. I find that really deeply resonating with me, John, this idea, oh, not just of what I'm seeing in this story of Jesus, but even in my own life and my desire to control everything. For sure. And one of Heschel's beautiful phrases in that book is that he describes Shabbat as holiness in time. Mm. holiness in time and i love that so there's something of the sacred in that moment yeah. and and of course what he's appealing for is if uh, and i think actually ironically and gloriously this is the spirit of jesus in the conversation uh, what he's mm-hmm. appealing for is that if shabbat is reduced down to a day then it can mm-hmm. become something very functional but actually it is about the inhabitation of God in time. It's about God coming mm. into the moment. It's about us conscious of God in the moment and inviting him mm. in. Now, if you mm. if you land that idea on Jesus, this is exactly wow. what we're seeing in these Shabbat miracles, that you've mm. got literally God entering that time. He's entering that moment. Mm. He's bringing something into that Shabbat experience which I think God always intended there to be, but Mm -hmm. over years of change, tradition, and control, these things are now not only not expected, but no one can remember the last time anything like this happened. Mm -hmm. And now Mm -hmm. in a relatively short space of time, this radical young rabbi from up the north is like (laughs) bouncing around synagogues and people are getting healed in synagogues mm. on Shabbat. Now, chapter 14 is not in the synagogue, but like in the house of the Pharisee, that's a mm. pretty that's a pretty religiously yeah. loaded context. I mean, that's as loaded as it's going to yes. be outside of somewhere like a synagogue in the first century. Well, a ruling world. Pharisee, not just yeah. not just yeah. your run-of-the-mill Pharisee. <laughs> For sure. So, so he is challenging. And of course, mm. isn't it interesting that in two of the three Shabbat miracles. Mm. He asked the question, is it lawful? Mm. All right. He's asking yes. them. And then in the third one, uh, or the middle one, if you like, chapter 13, he's mm. absolutely told, you are out of order. You cannot heal on the Sabbath. And then that's when he responds mm. with, well, what about your donkey? If it's good enough for your donkey to be loosed, it's good enough for her to be loosed. So, so mm-hmm. it's interesting that all three miracles are connected to explanation and questions, which, mm-hmm. which again, uh, for our listeners, we're leaning into not just what Jesus does, does in the miracle, but the message behind mm-hmm. the miracle. And the three Shabbat mm-hmm. miracles definitely lean into a dynamic holiness in time liberation message, mm-hmm. 
which is much deeper than the miracle itself being performed. And and there's also like I think you see Jesus doing this everywhere. It, it's again this this idea of of harmony and fulfillment with the story of God. So mm-hmm. like I often think about what does Sabbath do. And so we have, we root Sabbath, obviously, in the creation story, but Sabbath really appears for Israel as a thing after the Exodus, doesn't it? And there's this incredible depth, I think, to this idea that a group of slaves, slaves who were being worked to death by the Egyptians, slaves who were being asked to make bricks with no straw, and they leave the 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 slavery they cross the red sea into the desert they've got this miraculous provision of manna as food and quail as meat and then they get given this sabbath on the seventh day you'll do nothing and i think that it's important not to miss the power of that to a group of slaves right your your entire existence the reason you've been fed provided for and given even though it's minuscule some level of care is because you're a machine, <laughs> mm. is because you can build things for us, your slave masters. Yeah. And the first thing that God does to the people is say, you can have a day off. <laughs> mm. You can have a day wherein you produce nothing and you still have value. And and that God will actually give you food that day, even though you've not done any work. And this upsets a philosophical piece that was there, I think, in the, in the mind of a slave, that mm. I can only live if I'm producing. And I want to almost just take that from that time period to the 21st century and say, I wonder if we've still forgotten that lesson, that that we are in other forms. And I want to be very cautious saying this because obviously slavery still exists in the world today, but, but there's also implicit and hidden slaveries, the slavery to production that we have in the contemporary Western context, particularly where it's like, what am I doing? What am I achieving? And what am I getting? And I wonder if we've still not learned this lesson that God wanted to teach the Israelites was one of the things that happens in a day off is that you are reminded that your value is not found in what you do, in what you create, in what you produce. For sure. It's beautiful. And and of course, it does fly in the face of a philosophy that is inherent, I Mm. think, in the West of I do, therefore I am. Mm. I think it's Greenberg who in his book talks about the challenge of Sabbath that says we are, when we practice Sabbath, we are unjustified by our productivity. <laughs> now, oh, if you lean so back good. into the Genesis account, I think it's all there. So so before mm-hmm. the man and the woman are set to work to rule the earth, subdue the earth and fill the earth, God says, enter rest. And, and I think... Not only are you getting a work from rest, but I think one of the profound ideas, and this leans back to our Sabbath miracles, David, one of the profound Mm -hmm. ideas is that the Lord is saying in Shabbat, you are worth because of Mm -hmm. who you are, not because of what you do. You are not Mm -hmm. justified. You are not valued by your productivity because the first Mm -hmm. humans are valued and they haven't done anything yet. They're valued because they're made in the image of their creator. So if you carry that idea forward to these gorgeous miracles, then it's interesting all three people who are healed are marginalized. They are Mm -hmm. worthless. I don't mean worthless as one word, but they're worthless on the strata of Mm. their society. And Jesus Mm. heals on the Sabbath because he is mm-hmm. restoring worth to these people. Mm-hmm. Daughter of Abraham. This man healed in the presence of a prominent Pharisee's house. Um, mm. And actually, you've got a sense of what is the, what are these Sabbath healings doing? Well, they're not just giving people use of their physicality back. They are restoring mm-hmm. their worth and value back. And what mm-hmm. better place to restore worth than on a day that was established on the basis of human worth. And 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 I think that's part of the spirit of Sabbath that Jesus is bringing back into this. And a little interesting nuance here, David, on this is that, is that dropsy was an interest. I mean, the, the Greek on that is very, very interesting. Literally sort of, it's, it's a word that points to water and face. And the idea that the, that the face becomes filled with water 
is the sort of so so the idea of dropsy here or whatever this one literally the person mm. becomes inflated they become bloated as it were and mm. and there is some research that suggests that people with dropsy were often used as metaphors of greed and avarice because they looked bloated they mm. looked obese they looked large they mm. looked they looked as if they were living a greedy life and how tragic that not only are these people suffering, but now their suffering is used as a metaphor for something that has absolutely nothing to do with their suffering. And mm. Jesus, in the midst of Shabbat, the day of worth and value, the day of freedom and restoration, sets this man free, heals and mm. looses him. And I think I think there's a bit of a worth value conversation going on in in just that yeah. moment as well, if we're if we're connecting it to Shabbat. Something I noticed in verse six that I was just reading when I was, you know, preparing for our conversation today. Um, a lot of the translations say something like verse six is something like they couldn't answer or they, 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 they didn't have a reply. But it's quite interesting. Again, in its form in the Greek, in the Greek, it's fine. Like the they couldn't answer this is a totally okay translation. Mm -hmm. But it, the way the Greeks functions is it's like it literally kind of reads end. They were not able. The word is uh, iskusan. It's almost they were almost not strong enough. Is is kind of alluded to in that. It's the notion of strength. They were not able to give a reply to this one. Mm. And and I think what you get in the Greek that's just just not so explicit in the English is it's it's they can't offer a reply to Jesus's logic right? to this to this. It's not that they're oh I can't think of anything to say. It's that. Actually, your your logic is 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 too good there. There's nothing I can say back to that. I, and I love that sense of because Sabbath is about value, mm -hmm. <laughs> because Sabbath is 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 not about greed. And we've got this person here. If we listen to your nuance, that potentially is sometimes perceived as a public image of, of of greed, when actually the opposite is true. We've got somebody for whom society wants to ignore. There's a whole host of Sabbath images. So Jesus' point to say, but this is Sabbath. And actually, and this is where I love Nolan's comment, that people now have a new experience of Sabbath as a day of liberation. Well, actually, ironically, Sabbath was always a day of liberation. But it, but it had become a day of control. Mm -hmm. It had become a day of, 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 of the wrong things. And Jesus holds that in. And I wonder then if that's the link to the next part of the story, wherein Jesus now starts to talk about honor and status and where you sit at the table, because it's still a conversation about how we perceive worth and value. Do you think that's the connecting piece? Oh, I do. Absolutely, 100%. And, and I think if you grab the sort of value idea, worth idea, that really pushes through nicely into the first little mini parable, because you've sort of got Mm. immediately after the healing you've got like these two little mini parables that sort of relate mm. like the best seats yeah. in the house verses 7 to 11 and then the dinner party conversation verses 12 to 14 and they almost sit together like a nice little couplet they're different but they're very very mm. similar but they are saying yes. different things in this yes. context and it is interesting they're building to a climax so best seats in the house stuff jesus noticed people are taking the seats of honor. And he essentially tells a funny little story. You, you don't want to be caught in the wrong <laughs> seat, essentially. And if you've, if you've got your head yes. screwed on here, sit in the lowest seat because it's better to be called up. And then he says, but then he says this, those, the, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and the humble mm. will be exalted. And this sort of idea of not leaning into your own sort of sense of importance within this, but mm. making sure you are understanding your worth and value in relationship to the Lord, not to your own mm. perceived status, because within that parable of the best seats, it's all about how they perceive status, the seats of honor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the seats that we think are the best seats. And the Lord's mm -hmm. essentially saying, but actually that's that's got nothing to do with what we're about. And and if we yes. live our life according to that value system, we'll end up really leaning into exalting ourselves. And mm -hmm. that gets us on the wrong side of the equation when it comes to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, when you lean into the dinner party one, it climaxes almost leaning back to the man with dropsy. 
it climaxes mm-hmm. with. But when you give a banquet, invite who? Well, the poor. Invite mm-hmm. the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Now, here's an interesting thought, David. Though the man with dropsy was there, he wasn't invited. Mm. And that's, that's, again, where I suspect this is a setup. So he has been strategically positioned in front of Jesus. He's certainly not mm. been invited to this dinner party. So not only does yes, Jesus yes. heal him, but Jesus then flags up the fact, I know what you've been up to. I know this guy <laughs> isn't here because you want him at your dinner table, because you wouldn't be caught dead with mm. someone like him at your dinner table. But I'm telling you, he's mm. the sort of person you should be inviting to your dinner table. And if you do yes. that, then you will be blessed and, mm. and in the most incredible way. And then that climax, of course, leads into the great bike, which we'll pause there. But but, but it, it, I, I think those two mini parables are absolutely connected yeah. to what's going on yes. with healing on the Sabbath. There's an underlying grace narrative that's quite beautiful in this that, that I think is always worth highlighting, that, that Jesus is talking about gift exchange in this. Mm. I can host a dinner and invite you. Mm. And the question is, how, how generous is that really? Because mm. we like each other. But I also, you've given great gifts to me. I've, I've given, it's just how it works yeah. in friendship. But at some point, somebody might say, well, is that really grace and generosity anymore? When you then give to somebody that will never be able to give back or invite somebody who can, and the moment you start talking about, well, this person might not be able to repay this, you've now moved into grace, haven't you? You've now moved into well, this is this is unearned what we're dealing with here and unrepayable. And so you realize that this Jesus vision of a banquet table is rooted in all of that Sabbath stuff again. You know, that that, that you're not going to work today, but you are going to have food and you can't pay that back and God's going to keep us alive. And it's all part of the story. You're going to work from rest. You're, it just seems to me that if you're willing to sort of peel back all the layers of the onion, all of Jesus's core theologies are being kind of moved around here in what seems like, if you're not careful, a relatively throwaway comment about who you should invite to a dinner party. Yeah, superb. And and of course, it, it all starts with this incredible act of grace that Jesus, in ministering to this man, he asked the question, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Is it so? Mm-hmm. So, in a sense, he's asking a grace question. He's asking, "Is it yes. okay to dispense grace on Shabbat?" I mean, that's mm-hmm. what he's asking, yeah. isn't it? Which, of course, in our story, is so ridiculous a question, actually, because Shabbat has always been about grace, isn't of it? Of course, it has. <laughs> of course, it has. But remember, we're on a trajectory. So, this is the mm-hmm. third Sabbath healing clash about to come up. Mm. So, and on both occasions, we've had the same nutty sort of, and I mean nutty, I mean difficult, I don't mean crazy nutty. I mean the same (laughs) nutty sort of idea that's gnawed away at the heart of this. Mm -hmm. Actually, is this good to do or not? Jesus preempts this by going, asking the question, right, okay, is it okay to dispense grace on Shabbat? And the answer has Mm -hmm. got to be, well, of course it is. But of course, their response is silence they remain silent and then it says this and i love the phraseology here taking hold of the man he healed him and loosed him and of course in in my english translation it sent him away it's that apoluo again and we we bumped into that a few times in our in our journeys together that loosing idea that's in luke Mm. 13 and he doesn't just heal him but but looses him Mm -hmm. now of course i think the nuance are he sends him on his way but but what a beautiful picture there of grace. He takes hold yeah. of him. The man doesn't ask. Yes. In fact, the man never speaks, never says anything. So Jesus takes know, hold right? of him, a proactive moment of grace. He heals him mm. and then sends him. He doesn't ask anything mm. from him. He doesn't say, right, okay, fill in this yeah. card, join my club, join my team. Oh, yeah. and by the way, on your way out, make sure you drop some coins in the box. It's nothing. He's just healed yeah. and sent. Yeah. Healed and sent. Healed and it's just... It, and to me, this is magnificent grace, which then mm-hmm. the two parables sort of nudge into. If you're vying for mm-hmm. the best places, you've missed the point of God's economy. And also, if you're only inviting mm-hmm. people who are going to pay you back, literally or metaphorically, into your world, 
then you're missing mm. something of the greatness of God's grace and generosity in the kingdom. Mm. So I, I think it's a powerful yeah. strain the whole way through. This isn't just a miracle, which of course it is, and the man gets wonderfully yeah. healed, but it is a powerful Shabbat message at the heart of mm. this miracle, which this community more than most really, really, mm. really, really, really need to get. And isn't it interesting that Jesus is reserving this message for this moment because mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. this group of people that absolutely have to get this message. If they get this, yes. the world changes. Sh Sabbath suddenly gets liberated. People mm -hmm. get liberated and the kingdom of God can come. If these people don't get it, then they're going to continually resist the Lord of the Sabbath doing what he wants to do mm -hmm. on the Sabbath. And it's, yeah, I mean, I mean oh goodness, <laughs> just rewind that bit and listen to everything John said there again. That's <laughs> that's the best thing I want to say right there. But go to that bit on your phone. It allows you just to go back to a minute or so. Like, don't miss that that, that that's being said just there. That That's really, really important to grasp what, what Jesus is doing there. Because that, there's, there's warning for us in that and there's grace for us. In that, like I just noticed, John, as, as you're saying that, it, the verse four, again, my translation says they said nothing. Some translations, but they were silent. Mm. The nuance of the text is that they became silent. Mm. And I almost feel like there's this little message for us today that when you find yourself leaning into places of control, leaning into places of exclusion, leaning into places of needing to earn things. It's almost like probably the best thing for you to do is be quiet. <laughs> probably the best thing for you to do is just become silent because because you, you're going to miss. Jesus, is it lawful? Is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they became silent. So Jesus held him, healed him, and released him. You know, yeah. nobody else is going to object to this. This is just what I'm going to do. And I'm just thinking, John, personally, how easy it is to fight for that control, just not over something like Sabbath, over everything, and, and to exclude and, and, and work it out and, and, to, and to hold particular space. And I think there's something really powerful in what Jesus is modeling for us here of, of just making sure that when we're about to lean into trying to control things, we may want to go quiet and just think about how Jesus, how Jesus behaves. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's beautiful. Mm. And I think that is mm. the spirit of Sabbath. And I, mm. I would urge all of us to, to consider inviting the Lord of the Sabbath into our world, inviting that mentality of grace, generosity, of trust that he is greater than the circumstances we face and also he is bigger than the situations we are in and he's able to lead and guide us and help us in the midst of all of that and absolutely i think it's a beautiful beautiful okay so that's it for our episode thank you so much for listening we hope that you enjoyed it if you want to get in touch with either of us about something we said, you can reach out to us on podcast at twotexts.com or by liking and following the Two Texts podcast on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Don't forget this week, if you go to YouTube, you're able to catch up on Two Texts Unedited, an unedited video version of this podcast. If you did enjoy this episode, we'd love it if you left a review or a comment wherever you're listening from. And if you really enjoyed this episode, why not share it with a friend? Don't forget, you can listen to all our podcasts at www.twotexts.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. But that is it for this episode. We'll be back on Thursday with our next part of this series. But until then, goodbye. Goodbye.